Hey everyone, how's it going? It's Blake here from ChessPathways.com, and in this advanced opening training, we're going to be talking about memorization in the opening. Memorizing long lines is one of the things that scares a lot of players off from really trying to build a very strong opening repertoire, and they resign themselves to playing things like the Kali system their whole life. I think a lot of players have this misconception that to play 20 moves from memory to begin a chess game, you have to be a grandmaster, or you have to be an international master. And that's just not the case. In fact, you don't even have to be an expert or a master. I've since become a master, but I remember the first time that I got to play 17 moves from memory to begin a tournament chess game, I was only a 1600 player. And the opening wasn't even one that I had spent a long time analyzing and researching and preparing, it was just a line that I knew because I played it in a blitz game, and I took the time after the game to analyze it and learn the ideas of the opening. And then when that same line happened in a tournament, I remembered the ideas, and I was able to find those 17 moves myself and get a good position. But because there are so many players out there who say things like, oh, I could never memorize 25 moves, my goal with this video is to prove you wrong. I'm going to walk through some of the most long and complex lines from my opening repertoire, and by the end of this video, if you follow along with me, you'll realize that opening memorization doesn't have to be as unattainable as you might think it is. But one quick caveat before we dive in, memorization isn't the only aspect to building a master level opening repertoire. In fact, contrary to popular belief, it's not even the most important aspect or even the second most important aspect. So if you're working on building the opening repertoire of your dreams, but you have some questions about how to go about it, just get in touch with me, let me know in the comments, I'm happy to point you in the right direction. So let's jump in, and we're going to get started with a line from the Nidor variation of the Sicilian. So we start with e4, c5, knight f3, d6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3, and the Nidor a6. I'm guessing that most of you, if you're watching this video, are at least familiar with these moves. And against the Nidor, my favorite line to play is the English attack where white's going to play f3, bishop e3, queen d2, castle to the queen side, and then try to launch a pawn storm here with g4 on the king side. Now, when we're talking about opening memorization, one thing that's so important, yet so many players forget to do, is to understand the ideas of the moves that are being played and try to craft a narrative around them. Don't just go by rote memorization. Really try to understand what's going on. So pay attention here, I'm going to explain this long main line and the reasons for all these moves, and then I'm going to go back to this position and see if you can do it all from memory. So here we go. I like to start with f3. I know a lot of players start the English attack with bishop e3 first, uh, but f3 makes a lot of sense. You just stabilize this pawn, you avoid the, the, the knight g4 line, and white's getting ready to implement their idea to play bishop e3, queen d2, and castle to the queen side. In the line we're going to look at today, black immediately strikes at the center with e5 at their first opportunity, driving this knight away and freeing up this bishop to develop. This knight's only reasonable move, of course, is to come to b3. And now black plays bishop e6, bishop e3, and black's just going to calmly get all their pieces into the game. Bishop e7, queen d2, castle, castle, and now instead of b5 right away, again, black wants to get all those minor pieces to their best square, and black's going to play knight b to d7, making sure not to block this c file. Okay, now both sides have all their minor pieces developed. We have an opposite side castling situation, and we know that that means that it's usually time to attack, right? You can recklessly throw these pawns towards the enemy king because you're not leaving your own king behind. So here we go, g4, b5. White plays pawn to g5, going ahead as fast as possible, gaining the first tempo by attacking this knight. And black responds with a counterattack, pawn to b4. So both sides push that knight's pawn as fast as they can. White goes ahead and saves their knight, forcing this black knight to go to the back rank. Knight to e8. And now, sometimes white will continue with h4 in the English attack, but in this particular line, white usually plays f4. And it makes a lot of sense why this move appeals to white here. White's threatening f5, really putting this bishop in a bad spot. And if this pawn was to get exchanged, now this knight would have the d4 square available again. This knight is pretty restricted here on b3, but if this e5 pawn gets eliminated, this knight gets access to d4 again. So, okay, f4 is the move here from white you should know. Black plays a5, white plays pawn to f5, and once again black meets this with a counterattack, and black plays pawn to a4. 
now we have one of the most critical positions of this whole line. The bishop's under attack, the knight's under attack. Both sides are really going ahead as fast as they can with these pawns. We've just seen a bunch of pawn moves in a row. And now what's white going to do? Moving this knight away doesn't look so great, because after knight a1, I mean, it's obvious black's gaining the upper hand if white has to play knight a1. You could take the bishop. That's another line, but we're not going to look at that right now. We're focusing on memorizing this main line as deep as we can. And the key move to know is knight b to d4. A surprising sacrifice at first glance, but it makes a lot of sense. White's threatening knight to c6 winning material, and of course this bishop is still under attack. Black should at least win a piece for it. So e takes d4, knight takes d4. Black's up a piece, but white's going to win material back because this bishop's under attack and knight c6 is threatened. So what should black do here? Taking on a2 right away isn't too appealing. It allows knight to c6. So instead, black usually tries to open those lines to the white king. Again, we know in these opposite side castling situations, you want to do that as fast as possible, and black should play pawn to b3. This move seems pretty effective because neither capture here is going to be good for white. White does not want the c file or the a file to get opened up, and white can't just play knight c6 right now because then b takes a2 would make a queen for black. So white should play king to b1, very normal move when you castle long. Black will usually take here on c2 and give check. And this is a good move to play because white has to deflect one of their pieces from its best square here. If we take with the king, for example, that's definitely not good. Black would get to play rook c8, which does multiple things. It stops our threats to play knight c6 and allows this bishop to save itself. This bishop's almost trapped, but the bishop would get to, to come to c4 or maybe even take on a2. And if we don't get to play knight c6 and win a piece back and black gets to save their bishop, then black just stays up a piece. If we take with the queen then we're not going to have enough defense here on our g5 pawn. That could be an issue in some lines. So the purpose of black taking here on c2 is it forces white to capture with the knight, and that gets rid of our threat here to play knight c6. So knight takes c2 is the move to know. Now you might be wondering, you know, isn't white down a piece? White sacrificed a piece here playing knight d4, and now they don't have this knight c6 idea anymore, so how is white going to get their piece back? And the answer is that this bishop on e6 happens to be trapped. So what should black do about this? Black should sell this bishop as dearly as they possibly can, not by taking the a2 pawn and winning a pawn right away. It's more important to open the a file. Again, these open lines are everything. So not bishop takes a2. Bishop b3 is the main line. Bishop takes a2 is a sideline, but again, we're focused on going deep, not wide right now. So bishop b3, white of course has to win their piece back. The only move that makes sense is a takes b3. And now, white should play the logical move knight a3 to seal off the a file for the time being. Black's most popular move here is to play knight e5, hop into this active outpost. And the final move I want you to memorize here, a very logical move that I like to play, is queen to g2. This is a great multi-purpose move. It lets the queen defend the e-pawn. It unleashes the rook to pin the queen for the time being. And probably most importantly, white's threatening to play pawn to f6, because black would not be able to play g takes f6. g takes f6 would come with check, and white would win a piece. So here we go. We're 22 moves in. If you want, you can go through that slowly. Go through it twice if you need to. But then what I want you to do when you're ready is come back here to move 5. I'm going to delete all these other moves so you don't get to cheat and look over here to the right. And I want you to get out your chessboard, whether it's a virtual or whether it's a, you know, a physical chessboard in front of you, and try to play these 22 moves ending with 22 queen g2. Remember the high level narrative. White plays f3, castles long, black plays e5 to strike at the center, and black gets all their pieces into the game. And then finally, once both players are castled, we see a bunch of pawn moves. That'll get you to around move 16. And then if you remember those tactical considerations I mentioned, it should let you analyze those positions and find the right move. Now, one thing you'll find when you do this exercise is you might not find the right move right away. A lot of people think opening memorization is all or nothing. Either you know the move or you don't. And that's just not the case. You'll see even grandmasters do this all the time where it looks like they're out of their preparation. They're sitting there thinking for 10 minutes and then they find a move and then they're right back to playing moves quickly as if they're back in preparation again. Sometimes you don't know the move off the top of your head. So you sit there, you start analyzing, just like you always do in a chess game, and then you see that the ideas you're coming up with match with things that you've looked at before. They feel familiar to you because you've put in the work away from the chessboard, and that's what jogs their memory. 
So before we move on, I really want you to do this. Pause the video, get out your chessboard, and try to play these 22 moves. I definitely think this is a completely attainable goal for a decent chess player to aspire to. There's no magic behind it. You don't have to be a grandmaster. So go ahead and try it, and then let me know in the comments how you did. All right, are you back with me? Let's go ahead and move on to the next opening. My hope is that at least one of these openings I'm going through today will not be familiar to you, so you can get this practice in of trying to memorize a line in an unfamiliar opening just from learning the ideas and crafting that narrative around the moves. So this one's going to be from the Botvinnik Slav. So we're going to start with a Slav defense, d4, d5, c4, c6, knight to c3, knight f6, knight f3, e6. We get the semi-Slav. Very common opening position. I'm sure that most of you out there are at least vaguely familiar with this position. And here, white has to make a choice if they're going to block in this bishop or not. If they play e3, then they get to defend their c4 pawn here, but they block in the bishop. Or white can play more ambitiously and try to free this bishop. So bishop g5 is going to be the move we're looking at. And in this line, the Botvinnik Slav, black is going to put white to the test and take this undefended c4 pawn, finally. It's been undefended for a few moves here. But black is telling white, you're not going to get away with freeing this bishop and then playing e3 to defend your pawn. You can't have it all. If you want this bishop free, I'm going to take your pawn. And this can set off a very long line. So white's main move here is e4, not only threatening to win their pawn back, but also threatening to attack this pinned knight with a pawn, which looks very scary. But even though it looks scary, black definitely has to play b5 here and defend that pawn. It would not make any sense at all to play something like bishop e7 and then give white the pawn back, and now white has the full center. That's definitely not what you had in mind when you took that c4 pawn. You're going to try to hold on to it. So not that. Coming back here after e4, black's going to play b5, just defending their extra pawn. White's going to play their most obvious move, e5, attacking this pinned piece with a pawn. And now black only has one move that doesn't lose material. So even if you didn't have anything memorized here, you would find this move. Black has to play h6 and counterattack that piece. White should play bishop h4 and just maintain this pin. And now black has to play g5 to break that pin. Otherwise, they're going to lose that piece for free. And now white has a nice knight sacrifice. White can play knight takes g5. And this makes a ton of sense. White's getting two pawns here for the piece. But after h takes g5 and bishop takes g5, white's getting the piece back. Because once again, this knight is pinned. It's attacked by a pawn. And there's no more in-between moves with h6 this time. We can already see we're going to get a very imbalanced position. White has this big mass of pawns over here on the king side. Black has a pawn majority here on the queen side. And one of black's ideas might be to castle queen side and put a lot of pressure here on the king side with rooks on the g and h files. So black's main move here is knight b to d7. Makes a lot of sense. You don't want to allow bishop takes f6 with a fork. So black reinforces that knight and gets closer to castling queen side. White can play here g3. Uh, if white's afraid that black's going to put pressure on the g and h files, it makes a lot of sense to fianchetto this bishop, get another key defender for the king before you castle kingside, as well as put pressure on this diagonal. This c6 pawn looks like it might be a target. White doesn't have to take this knight right away. This knight really has no way to save itself. So, okay, after knight b to d7 and g3, black plays bishop b7, again getting closer to castling. White can play bishop to g2. We knew that was coming because of white's last move here, g3, helping to neutralize this bishop along the diagonal. Black here plays queen to b6, a great multi-purpose move. It breaks the pin here to the knight, helps support possible pawn advances here on the queen side, and also gets black ready to castle. You should know what white's next move is if you stop to think about it. Black just broke this pin to the queen, so white better take their piece back here or they're not going to get that knight back. So e takes f6, black castles, and white castles. Once again, we get an opposite side castling situation, and you could say the opening phase of the game is over. So think about what black should do here, and it should make sense if you think about it that black should play pawn to c5 and strike at the center. Black's helping to set their pawn majority here in motion on the queen side. Black's opening up this bishop that was blunted by that pawn, and black's also threatening to try to open this d-file where they have a rook eyeing that queen here on d1. So for all these reasons, white usually wants to keep the d-file closed, and that means white's going to play pawn to d5. They don't want to trade away this excellent defender of the king, and they have enough support to play this move. Black only has two attackers on the d5 pawn, and white currently has three supporters there. So now what's black going to do? Black's going to march onward on the queen side and play b4. 
Again, very sensible move. Kicks this knight away from the defense of the d5 pawn, advances black's pawn majority, and this is the kind of position where one tempo can mean everything, so white should play knight to a4 and counterattack that queen. Again, there is an alternative move here, but again, we're going deep, not wide, focusing on memorization for now. So, okay, the queen's attacked here. Where do you think black should put it? Again, try to think and build this narrative in your head. You can pause the video if you need to. But black's main move is queen to b5. Uh, this is a good square for the queen. It keeps an eye on the knight, keeps an eye on the c4 pawn, and also stays out of the way of any tactics. So, now what? What's white going to do? If white does nothing, black's probably just going to move this knight next turn, and then because they've kicked this knight away, they're going to have overwhelming pressure against this pinned d5 pawn, and it's not so clear what white's doing here. Their pieces seem pretty blunted. So what's the number one thing you look for when those kings are castle opposite sides? You want to open lines to that king, right? So it should make sense that white plays the move a3 here a lot. If black takes on a3, or if white's allowed to play a takes b4, they get a nice open file here for the rook. And if black advances here with b3, now this knight gets the c3 square back. And even worse, black's pawn majority is really frozen there. It's really hard to see how black's going to advance their pawn majority. So black usually does not want to play b3 or take there. Black should instead continue with their plan, move this knight away, and intensify the pressure on this d5 pawn. And one of black's main moves here is to play knight to b8. Very clever move, nice knight retreat to the back rank, and now this d5 pawn is under serious pressure. In fact, it's very hard to see how white's going to defend this pawn. But let's take a look. White goes ahead and opens that file for the rook while they have the chance. A takes b4. Black goes ahead and undoubles those pawns. C takes b4. And it looks good for black that they got to undouble those pawns, but they also gave up control of the d4 square for now, and that gives white a nice little tactical resource, queen to d4, counterattacking the a7 pawn. Now, black could go ahead and take on d5 and lose the a7 pawn, but the king would be very vulnerable. One move here that seems to make a lot of sense is to play knight to c6. This was part of the idea of knight to b8. This move just defends the pawn, reactivates this knight, and seems to make use of this pin on the d5. In fact, if this queen retreats, black's ready to sacrifice the exchange with rook takes d5, eliminating this powerful bishop if white wants to win the material there, and black will have a very powerful pawn mass, a very powerful unopposed light squared bishop. So it looks like black's plan is working well here, but white's most popular way to answer this is to sacrifice the queen. White can play d takes c6. Black has to at least get that queen for it. They don't want to lose material for free, but now c takes b7 check, and this pawn is supported here by the bishop and very hard to dislodge. Black's going to step in front of that pawn with king to b8, and let's take stock of what just happened. White sacrificed their queen and they got some material for it. Not enough material by point count, but this pawn is very annoying for black to deal with. It's probably going to remain there far into the future. White has a nice open file here for the rook, and white has ways to intensify the pressure over here to the king, and black's going to have to be very careful. So try to think about what white could play here to intensify the pressure. And it's not bishop f4 check that's easily blocked by pawn to e5. So go ahead and pause if you want to think about it. But white's main move here is bishop to e3. A very nice move, attacking this rook. And if the rook moves away, there's going to be some tactics. I'm sure you probably calculated some of them if you paused the video. But let's say this rook moves away. Let's say rook d8. Now there's a problem here for black because there's going to be bishop takes a7. This king really has to take, and then there's going to be a, a discovery here where white goes ahead and wins that queen back. So that's not what black wants. Let's go back here after bishop e3. I'll just delete those moves that come after it. So black can't move this rook away. Black should play e5 and just reinforce that rook. And it kind of seems like we're in a position where traditional point count has just completely gone out the window. The concrete aspects of the position are what matter more. So how does white intensify their attack here? White has another very nice move, knight to c3, getting out of the way of this rook, intensifying the pressure to a7, attacking the queen, and it looks like the knight's hanging, but white's reasoning, hey, if this rook's pinned, I should try to attack it with a pawn, because then it can't really save itself. So, black can go ahead and take that knight, b takes, and now again, you can't move the rook, instead black should play bishop to c5. One final move just to get to 25, if white takes here and plays c takes d4, go ahead and think about how you would recapture, but you don't want to play e takes d4 because you'll actually get checkmated after bishop f4. Those two bishops coordinate very well. 
Instead, you would have to play bishop takes d4. And believe it or not, I've gotten this position in a game. More than once, actually. So it's not just some crazy 25-move sequence that can never happen. If you've been following along and trying to craft this narrative in your head, you'll see all these moves are really pretty logical. I think I played a game that continued rook f to b1, but then I just played queen c5. Black kind of has everything under control for the time being here. And black has an unopposed queen and strong passed pawn, and I went on to win a couple games from this position. So once again, I challenge you, let's go back here to move four. I challenge you to pull out your chessboard and try to go through that. And before I delete all these moves, let's just one more time just go through the narrative at a high level. We have a semi-slav. White chooses to free the bishop instead of locking it in. Black decides to take up the challenge and take on c4. White plays the most obvious sequence there, playing e4, you know, double attacking the, the pawn and threatening to play e5. A long, very forcing sequence happens. Of course, black has to defend that pawn, and then white attacks this pinned knight. White plays that knight sacrifice to make sure they can pin that knight again with the, with the bishop recapturing on g5. Both sides really develop as fast as they can. Black castles queen side and white castles king side, and black launches this uh, this pawn advance on the queen side. And if you understand the ideas of the opening at a high level, you know, you're going to be amazed what you're able to recall when you sit down at that chessboard and do your own analysis. Again, don't use this as the end-all be-all. This memorization really supplements your own analysis and fills in the gaps and helps jog your memory and confirm the ideas that you're coming up with when you're analyzing yourself over the board. So once again, I'm going to clear all the moves after bishop g5, starting here in the semi-slav. Again, pause the video, set up the position on your chessboard. I want you to play those 25 moves ending with queen c5. And if you want to make it more realistic, like you're in a tournament game, you can play the move for black and then cheat and look back at the video and play white's move and then try to find the next move for black and do it that way as well. That might help make it more realistic. Okay, if you're back with me, I hope you were successful. Again, let me know in the comments how it worked out. Let's just do one more opening in this video. Let's come back here all the way back to move one and let's go through a line in the Karo Khan. So e4, c6, d4, d5, and let's say we're studying a line from the Panov variation. So in the Panov, white goes ahead and exchanges here on d5. So we have e takes d5, c takes d5, and now pawn to c4. And the Panov is often most known for being an isolated queen's pawn kind of opening. Often these pawns are going to get exchanged, and white's going to be left with this isolated d-pawn. I'm sure most of you know what that is. Black's going to play knight f6, knight c3, and now black has a few moves here. I'm going to be covering the knight c6 line here. Black could block in this bishop, but in this particular line, black is leaving this bishop open so that if this knight comes to f3, this bishop can free itself from the pawn chain, pin that knight. Now, it could be a little dangerous because this undefends the b7 pawn. There's always these ideas with queen b3, but we're going to see that if white goes for this, there's a long tactical line that works out okay. So, let's say white goes for it. Let's say white plays knight to f3, almost daring us to free this bishop, and we go ahead and do it. Bishop to g4, and I'm going to be using this for the starting position for our memorization. And here, let's say white tries to exploit that we move this bishop and try to counterattack the b7 pawn. So white should do this by taking on d5 and then playing queen b3. If they play queen b3 right away, they have to watch out for knight a5. But by taking here on d5 first... They make sure there's no in-between moves. Queen takes d5 is a threat, and queen takes b, uh, b7 is a threat as well. So again, begin crafting that narrative. Black frees their bishop. White tries to exploit it by counterattacking this b7 pawn and making use of some tactics with queen to b3. So now, what does black do? It looks like they can't defend all their material here. Well, black starts by wrecking the white pawn structure. Black can at least play bishop takes f3, g takes f3. And now black decides to defend their knight here on d5, play e6, and they're going to let this b7 pawn fall. So e6, very important. Black just plays it calm, opens a line for this bishop, and if this b7 pawn gets taken, then this d4 pawn is hanging. So let's take a look. Queen takes b7, knight takes d4. Now black's the one who seems to have a lot of threats here. White can't really tolerate this knight on d4, so white can get rid of it with bishop b5 check, exploiting this vulnerable king here. Black definitely has to take this bishop, so knight takes b5, and now white has a nice in-between move. White does not have to take their knight back right away. White can play queen c6 check. This is one of the key moves of this line, and it's really why this whole line with bishop g4 looks kind of dangerous at first glance, because it's clear here that black cannot castle, right? Black can't play queen d7 because it would hang the rook in the corner, so black has to play king e7, 
and now white can win their piece back with queen takes b5. So, okay, now there's many ways black can handle this position. Again, we're going deep, not wide right now. So the one I want to show you today is taking on c3, making this exchange, and then just playing rook b8 and activating this rook. Black has a lot of open lines here for the pieces and a tempo on the queen, and white is not yet castled. The real downside of this move is it does allow white to win a pawn with queen c5 check. Now, I do want to point out that bishop a3 looks tempting, but it turns out after king f6, black has a very good position because black gets a discovered attack on this bishop, the queen's still hanging, the king is surprisingly uh, invulnerable here for the time being, and black has a big advantage. But I don't want to prove that right now. Again, I want to focus on one main line to memorize. So instead, after rook b8, again, just to go through it one more time, after queen takes b5, the line we're looking at is knight takes c3, and then immediately rook b8. White can win a pawn, queen c5 check, forking the pawn and king, king e8, queen takes a7, and now bishop d6, finally developing that minor piece, defending the rook, and it looks like black's getting ready to castle, but of course black can't castle, they already played king e7. So I've had this position in a tournament game. My opponent, who was a master, played here queen to a4 check, so we'll focus on this line. And now you might think that black should keep queens on the board because black's down a pawn, but surprisingly black has great compensation in this endgame. Black can play here queen to d7, and after queen takes d7, king takes d7, Black's down a pawn, but Black's going to play rook h to c8 very fast. Bishop e5 could be played to intensify the pressure. If this bishop moves away, then our rook has access to the second rank. And in master level chess games in my database, Black has actually scored very well from this position. So okay, this one's a little bit shorter, only 18 moves. Let's go back there to the position after uh, bishop to g4. White just played knight f3, bishop g4. So again, get that narrative straight. White tries to exploit the missing bishop with the early queen b3, only after taking here on d5, of course, so they have a target here for the queen on d5 as well. Black just calmly defends the knight and opens up their other minor piece, this bishop. Black takes on b7, black can take on d4, white has to play bishop b5 to get rid of the knight, and it sets up their in-between move, queen c6. That already gets you more than halfway there, and then when you get that position on the board and you're analyzing it as if you're playing the game, see if your memory gets jogged by those ideas I talked about. I bet you'll be able to reach this position after 18, king takes d7. So, okay, I'm going to clear these moves now. Everything after bishop g4 is going away. Go ahead and set up this position on your board. I trust you to do the work, and let me know what kind of results you get. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope this training was helpful to you. And if you have any questions at all about building a master-level opening repertoire that's going to give you a big edge on your competition, make sure you let me know. All right, thanks, and I'll see you in the next training.